Ja, ähm, hallo und herzlich willkommen ähm, heute Nachmittag oder am frühen Abend äh, hier im Kino des Deutschen Filmmuseums und Filminstituts ähm, zu einer Vorführung von drei Filmen von Robert Beavers. Ähm, ich glaube, ich habe ein bisschen durch unsere alten Akten quasi durchgeblättert äh, und das letzte Mal, dass wir wirklich viel von Robert Beavers geschaut haben, war in den 80ern, das war vor meiner Zeit hier und auch bevor ich geboren wurde, deswegen freue ich mich besonders, äh, <lacht> ähm, mal was sehen zu können, auch im Kino und äh, kann, dann, kann, kann dazu nur sagen, dass es ähm, Zeit ist, mal wieder das, was läuft und ähm, dass es wirklich eine seltene Gelegenheit ist, überhaupt äh, Filme von Robert Beavers äh, hier in Frankfurt zu sehen und ich mich sehr freue. Ähm, es gibt, äh, wird drei Filme geben, einmal Ruskin in einer wirklich wunderschönen 35mm Kopie, und äh, danach The Suppliant und Listening to the Space in My Room, beide auch von 16mm Kopien, die wirklich auch sehr schön sind von der Schärfe, also kann man sich darauf freuen und quasi noch viel besonderer ist, dass äh, Robert Beavers heute auch persönlich anwesend ist, um quasi das Screening zu begleiten und danach für Fragen ähm, bereit zu stehen. Genau, und jetzt begrüßen Sie bitte Robert Beavers. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, of course, thanks. Uh, the Film Museum for undertaking the screening and um, I think I will not say too much about the films except that um, Ruskin was made over a period of a few months, um, if I remember correctly, uh, during mostly winter months and it's probably a very different Venice than um, the one that one encounters now. Um, and the film was re-edited in the late um, 90s, so it's um, a second a version uh, with also the sound changed uh, to some degree. Um, and the other two films are interconnected, as you'll see. Um, they both um, develop portraiture through um, the inhabited space, and I think that's enough for the moment. Thank you. And because Ruskin's writings are always dealing with um, you know, not only the past, his discovery of uh, you know, the history of Venice and the, the art and the architecture of Venice, but he's always using it also as a mirror for his um, current uh, surroundings, London. And, uh, and he was very interested um, also in geology and, um, and in social, um, in the lost loss of the hand as a, a creative uh, tool uh, through the industry of his period. So um, I actually use a different text at the end, um, and it's a, a small book called Unto This Last, because he also was a kind of political economist. Um, and so it's, it is, um, I am looking at, at Venice and the other locations. Uh, the other, the Alpine location is in the Bergel uh, in, in Switzerland. Um, so you know, I'm looking at them always uh, to a certain degree through, through his writings, through his drawings, through his a few photographs that I saw that he took, um, and uh, also using his book to lead me to locations. So I, I'm quite literally following the locations that he... Uh, my my um, addition to it was that I, I chose to film, for instance, the color um, parts um, at different times of the day. So I went very early in the morning, I went late in the afternoon and, and at noon. So not for every location, but for certain locations. And you know, I used, as I, uh, this was probably the film in which I used most consequently um, the uh, turning of the lens. Um, um, und ich glaube, es ist okay, dass wir uh, machen das in Englisch jetzt, oder? Uh, it's, it's okay, yes. Um, um, yeah, so that's more or less um, what I can tell you. At the moment. I mean, okay. if there are some other. It's, it was very interesting to see the um, uh, 
uh, to see it projected this afternoon because I actually saw different things than I had seen the last time that I that I saw it. Um, and we even had a couple of Cajun elements, one being, I think, the moth that was adding certain things and, and the other was, you know, the end and not the end. But, um, but that was okay. Yeah. Maybe you have to chase, chase it away for the next screening. But <laughs> That's right. Um, um, yeah, may, maybe another thing to, to add with this is uh, that um, I thought to myself um, during the screening that maybe the Venice Ruskin described is different from the one you filmed. So maybe did you also think about this difference between the two Venices? Or uh, you know, I strangely enough, I think I thought most about that um, <coughs> when I was doing the second sound recording. Uh, then I found... Um, um, it's very interesting to be in Venice and to listen um, because the sounds, the, the acoustics of, the, um, of a city is, is so different there. And um, so I, you know, I always have, I mean, not always, but of course sometimes I have thought about in general how every uh, period has um, its own perspective, its own acoustic, and of course it's not the same as, as, as his, um, but that's, that's what I'm working with. Yeah. So um, maybe um, we could also talk about, because you told us earlier that you re-edited the film, and um, I my, myself only know this version, but uh, maybe you could talk about the changes, or because I read that Ruskin was more, or the figure of Ruskin was more prominent earlier in the earlier versions uh, with the oh, voiceover. No. Or yes. Like, yep. yes. So maybe you could talk uh, about that a bit. So it it ended um, with the mountain, and um, I had his death date um, in between. I had his death date as, as the end of the film, after the mountain. And there was a reading, um, uh, a voiceover reading from The Stones of Venice. And um, so there is a version. Um, so when I talk about two versions, there are actually three versions. Um, but the first version was um, with this voiceover and uh, the death date. And, and he died in January 1900. So even though one thinks of him as, you know, this... Uh, 19th century figure. He he did live until 1900, um, and and then I didn't like the voiceover, and um, and I switched from, uh, and that's what gave me the um, uh, the impulse uh, to film the pages, to film the pages with the snow and the uh, the white line of the horizon going first down and then up, um, and um, yes, and then I still. Uh, then in the around 1992, uh, I did the third editing and uh, shortened it. And I think I took out about uh, 12 minutes, 15 minutes. Yeah. Here and there, snips yeah. all over. Oh, yeah. But you know, in, in, in revising something, what is very interesting is it, it doesn't change. <laughs> you know, it changes on certain level, but it, it doesn't on other levels. But, but you did it with uh, quite a few films of yours, right? So was this a general impulse or did it come like, oh, okay, I have to re re like re-edit this one and then... Uh, well, I, you know, I saw some of my very early films and I thought, oh, I can do something better with it. And, um, and so I re-edited them. And, and then the sound, uh, then, uh, then because I re-edited the image of those early films, I found that the sound didn't match at all. Uh, the the way the sound had been edited, so then I had to rework the sound, and and that took ten years. <laughs> yes, but uh, okay. Yes. So, uh, Gunter, you want to take? <laughs> Can you tell us something about your work with the uh, Bolex in the Rusk? films and the masks and uh, the whole film is made in the Bolex or it, it is not, you, you didn't something after 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 a filming. So maybe you can tell us something about how you worked with 
these black uh, things. <laughs> oh, well, you know, it's really sort of in the tradition maybe of silent film, um, um, because I use this kind of, I don't know what it's called in silent film, maybe an iris or... Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so I'm using the compendium, which is like a little theater in front of the lens, and it has okay. these different, you know, the, the back part and the front part, and I'm simply placing, um, sometimes the shape is on a piece of glass uh, that okay. I'm changing the exposure uh, while, while filming it, so that, you know, if you open the exposure, the, it gives more light, and so the object um, shrinks. And, or the other way around. Um, and I, you know, what fascinated me myself in looking at it has to do with the, sometimes with the edges of the movements of the mats. And um, I, I think it's very interesting, I'm sure you know this also as, as a filmmaker, um, uh, there is the part which is calculated, and there's the part which is totally uncontrolled. So, um, for instance, with, with the mats and the editing, while I was doing it, I didn't realize some things that happen, because you see it only on the screen. And okay. um, uh, so I... Um, because you edited it on this... Uh, you didn't edit it on an on a, uh, editing table. No. I edited it with rewinds, and um, and so this I edited uh, without a viewing table, just by sight, and um, and I think that. But you know, with knowing the measures, so it's done the the movements because these movements are so simple. You know, it's a horizontal movement, it's a vertical movement, it's the mats are moving. Uh, and, but, you know, the dimensionality, for instance, it was a very simple setup also. This is not, I also placed, um, I had a table and a wall, and I panned up and down between the, the mats that were horizontal and the mats that were vertical. For instance, you know, the little square, the white square, which is on the black background, and the black square, which is on the white background. So uh, I'm panning between... I also was very interested because it was, you know, my question was, how do you film a location? How do you film architecture? Mm-hmm. How, what, how to do this? How to place it on the screen? And I answered this somehow with the mats. Yeah. Um, and, and then using, of course, the acoustic and, uh, and then the time of the day for color. And, uh, and then, of course, at the end, the pages, uh, which somehow relate also to, uh, to the mats. And, was uh, you also put the mat um, with the with the chimneys in London yes you know you do this diagonal thing or yeah. with the with the mountain right I, I have never seen this before that you really correspond correspond yes. directly with the shape of the image yes yes I mean of course in everyone has their own ticks and uh, one of mine is the question of the diagonal and um, this ambiguity in perspective of the diagonal. So uh, it's flat, it's not flat, it goes into the space, um, and the diagonals that are in our view, you know. Uh, so I was fascinated at that moment. There's one also, there's this chimney in the, I think it's Piazza Santa Margherita, you see um, only the chimney and the, the shadow of the chimney and, and so forth. So... Um, Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for those films. Um, I was just wondering about the matter of erosion in, in architecture and uh, what you filmed. Could you, I don't know, it was something that came to my mind mm-hmm. when I saw these pictures a lot about the erosion of the arcs and the erosion of the uh, mountains. Could mm-hmm. you maybe... You know, I think that's actually a key thing that Ruskin has in his Stones of Venice. Is this? He has a very beautiful section about uh, how mountains uh, are created, and um, I don't remember the book very well, 
but um, uh, that was a, a very important thing for him. Um, and for me, um, you know, when I'm sometimes filming very close uh, a wall in Venice and, and then cutting to, for instance, the Alpine location and, and the grass, and um, I, I think that's when I'm trying to reach this uh, in that one particular location with the, with the arches. Yes. Sorry. Yes. No, it was very nice. Like it looked almost, almost the same. Yes, yeah. because that is a you know that's actually those are paths uh, from a distance. I'm across the across the way, um, looking looking at them. But I was living in that location, uh, so I had, and and the um, the colored part. Uh, at one point, you see this forest, and there's someone with a basket on I think on her back, and that's one of the largest chestnut forests in Europe. <clears throat> which is in the Bergel. And that was actually one of their main sources of, of income uh, earlier. Yeah. Yes. Any, anything else? Shall we? So, so um, maybe we can, uh, if there's any, any other questions? Uh, I want to know something. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because you, you, you said something about the sound design and that the sound design took you about, or the re design of the sound took you about 10 years for Ruskin? No, not no? for Ruskin, for 18 films. Okay, that's okay, so that's... <laughs> more. Um, so maybe you could uh, talk about your general, like, how do you approach um, doing sound? Because in Ruskin it seems um, sometimes like there's, the sh like, the sound comes from the shots, mm -hmm. or at least Suggests. in parts, yeah. And so, but but at other times it's like, and like, over the over the shots or so yeah maybe just a bit about your sound design because it's great yeah i mean it's in a way it's um you know first of all sound for someone like me uh, uh when i began making films in 1967 um the uh it was very very difficult to work with sound because it was so expensive um, you had to work in a studio, uh, you had to have a, a technician who was always uh, recording everything for you, and then you had to have the equipment to cut it, uh, and a table. Um, so I think, you know, when I did the sound, for instance, in the first, uh, the first or even the second version of Ruskin, um, I had to do it in maybe two or three days, uh, because I didn't have, you know, I, I, the limitations. Um, and. Um, so then I w went back to Venice and I did re-record re some sound and, and mixed it, keeping basically the ideas that I had had when I made the film in 1974-75. Um, so I was about 25 years old then. And, um, but developing it to a certain degree more. Um, and um, I kept the, actually, when, when I um, added the book at the end, then my idea was in some way that the organ would be, because Ruskin has this tremendous um, uh, sonority in his sentences, that for me, his voice is, is the organ. And, and I increased the volume as, as uh, I... Uh, repeat the sound, uh, sometimes connecting it to the book, and, and then later to, um, you know, to the window or to the mountain. And, um, uh, but, you know, I'm basically one member of a family that wants to use sound um, metaphorically, more as much as um, uh, and suggesting any kind of reality. Um, yeah. And it's, that's true in the other two films also. For instance, in, in the, the suppliant, I'm basically using the sound of the friend uh, whose apartment it was, and he is uh, actually drawing with a graphite pencil. Um, and I recorded that quite close. And it sounds actually very different in different cinemas. Um, so that's, um, but it's basically that sound. And then, a piece of music that a 
uh, a boyhood friend of him had given to him uh, that I then selected at the end. Yeah. And, of course, in the third film, um, the sound is uh, drawn, is really guided by the musician and, and then later by his wife also. Um, so and and the acoustics of the house because the house is a wooden house, and you know I would, uh, I'm sort of moving constantly between the different floors of the house, and also the sound sometimes is is placed between these different layers levels of the house. Yeah, I think that's one of the things I like most about the third film that it's. I mean, the title is listening to the space in my room, but actually it's more about the other rooms or. You, I mean, you need to work in your room, but it's also about looking at uh, what, what are the other ones doing, and this is also more interesting to listen. And yeah, so. well, it, literally, I was on the ground floor, and they were above me. Um, and uh, now Dieter has died, and Cecile is living downstairs. Um, and um, he was about ninety, maybe ninety, ninety-one, when I began filming, and. Uh, say 93, 94 when I finished. Uh, so, you know, I was very interested in how um, two things. One, he was a professional cellist, but he kept his unprofessionality in some way, his, his real love of music. And so that interested me. And the other thing was um, that at that age, and even, you know, at my age, um, in, uh, when I was filming it, uh, I was about, uh, I guess, 60. Uh, and so, you know, how one renews oneself also as, as a, anyone, as a filmmaker or not. Um, so that was in the back, back in uh, source for the, for the film, yeah. So are there any more questions from the audience? Good. So then, thank, thank you, you Robert. And also uh, make sure to stay for the next screening, which is Uta Aurans Rasen ist grün mit Pferden. But I'm sure you also um, already have tickets for this one since you have to see it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>